The sport of off-road racing is full of incredible stories, wild characters, legends, and even villains. We cover it all on offroadracer.com, but there's only so much we can put down in an article. Sometimes we have to dig a little deeper, and that means sitting down with some of our industry's most influential characters and hitting record. Welcome to the Off-Road Racer Podcast, a Mad Media production, made exclusively for offroadracer.com. Each month, we'll go beyond the dirt into the homes, shops, and lives of the most interesting and game-changing icons of our sport. You'll hear about their history, success, failure, and everything in between as we pull back the curtain and reveal the stories of their lives. I'm your host, Matt Martelli, and this is the Off-Road Racer Podcast. I'm Matt Martelli. This is Off-Road Racer, and I'm here with one of my favorite people, Scott Douglas. What's going on, man? Man, just hanging out here at Crandon and enjoying life. Yeah. Hey, first off, congratulations on you being inducted into the Off-Road Motorsports Hall of Fame. Uh, that That's a big deal. It, You know, it really is, and, and you don't realize how big it is at first, and then you, it sinks in and you go, it's a big deal. It really is. I mean, the, the people uh, that are in there right now, uh, you know, and... and um, the big names, and they were all my childhood heroes, and uh, and now I'm going to be in there with them. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I mean, we're sitting in in, in the barn here at Cran, and there's a lot of really cool historical photos, and uh, there's quite a few of you in here. Yeah, yeah. No, this place has been magical for me. I, I've i won three cups here, uh, and um, uh, two of the Borg Warners, and then the inaugural Amsoil Cup, and uh, a lot of big races, and just... Uh, when you have a truck that's working here and and you you're on there's nothing like this track and my favorite part everybody asks you what was your favorite part of the track everybody goes oh turn one this or that i says i'll throw it into the gravel pit i would throw it into the gravel pit 100 feet before the corner before anybody backwards and kind of like what kyle leduc you know is doing is known for as well and and um and when you have when you have a truck working that good, you get this confidence, and then it just builds and builds. And this place just and the people, and it's like you're racing, but you know that there's forty thousand people watching you. And then when you win here, the excitement it's is pretty neat. I, I like how casually you say throwing it back in for people who don't understand that. I mean, you basically pitch the truck backwards prior to the corner and set up for the eggs of the corner i mean it's one of the things that pro fours do that no other car probably the only car you could do it in is a rally car but a rally car doesn't have that that type of suspension it would probably bottom out and crash well a rally car can do it but we're we actually have more suspension and so when it's flat like that uh a rally car is probably more stable doing something like that because it it's unless it hooks a rut or hits a big hole which they couldn't make it around because there was big holes sometimes. Um, you know, they're going to be flat. Where we've got, you know, 18 inches of wheel travel. And so when we throw it in, we have to, you have to throw it in backwards and get on the gas to get that suspension set because you don't want it, you don't want it changing. Because basically, when I'm talking about backing it in, our data shows that we're backing it in around somewhere around 99 to 103 into that corner. And, um, you're basically just taking and throwing it sideways, uh, uh, throwing it backwards, and basic using the drive of the front drive and the rear drive. It's slowing you hardly using the brakes because it's slowing the car up as you drift around the corner. You get it right. It's the most awesome thing in the world. Uh, fans love it. Um, sometimes I got a little too carried away because the fans loved it too much or loved it so much that I, you know, there was times that I probably should have tiptoed around the inside, and, but. No, I'm gonna I'm gonna put on a show for him. Yeah, I mean it, it's it's one of those things about this sport in particular that's just incredible to watch because it's you know it's like it's not gravity, but it looks like it's gravity to find because you're you're like wait wait where is he going where is he going and then you see how it rockets you out of that corner and I mean it, it's a holy shit moment you know what I mean absolutely because once you you back it in a corner's wide about it right about the apex halfway through the corner you're basically sh shooting it out and that you're you're turning part of that corner into a straightaway now instead of all of a corner and so if you do it right you can really you you know it's kind of like motocross guys 
uh, when they used to diamond a corner, instead of going around the whole thing, they go over and hit the berm and diamond it out. If you do that right and you have the opportunity, it's the right kind of track. Save a lot of time. It looks strange sometimes, but this looks beautiful, though. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm a big rally fan, and it reminds me of the the Scandinavian flick that that rally car drivers do in, in some particular corners. Absolutely. And we do this back here in the woods, too, where we actually... You know, I, I watched a lot of videos early on when I started racing Crandon of rally guys and different things because back here it's not as wide. And so to try and get that thing rotated backwards like you want, it's really hard to do because you only got so much room. Well, well, those guys, they flick it one way and then whip it back the other. And once I learned how to do the whip, uh, it was just another, you know, trick in the toolbox. Yeah, no, that's really cool. You know, a lot of people don't know that you got your start in this in desert racing. You know, we were just kind of talking about, you know, the very, very beginning. Yeah. You know, t tell me that story of, like, how how this whole, you know, lifestyle slash addiction started. Man, it <clears throat> it's pretty crazy. I, I started on a motorcycle, uh, and, um, uh, and I just, I was basically riding a buddy of mine's motorcycle after school. I'm 12 years old. 13 years old anyway, and, and I, based, I started riding his motorcycle. We were sharing it. Parents didn't have a lot of money. We didn't have anything, and I would stay at his house because both my parents worked. And so we took, and um, all of a sudden, I started getting better and better on it. He goes, you're better on the motorcycle than I am. You know, I go, well, I want to get one of these things, you know. And so I told my parents, and they weren't all for it at all. And so, uh, and I was a chubby kid. I was all shy in school and everything. And so I took and... Uh, I got myself two lawnmower jobs and, or I mean, a lawnmower job and two paper routes and uh, started saving money and saving money, saving my lunch money, losing a bunch of weight and, and had a bunch of money saved up for, uh, uh, for a motorcycle. I'm going to buy it myself. My parents aren't, you know, and, and uh, I didn't want to defy them. I never would defy my parents, but this is something I really wanted. It was a craze. It's just something. And I grew up in the back of a Jeep, so I knew off-roading and stuff. <clears throat> and so, one day, my mom did my laundry, and uh, she was putting my clothes away, and uh, uh, and found found my stash of cash. And boy, when I got home that night, I had both parents there going, "You need to sit down, and you need to tell us what's going on," because <laughs> they had no idea what I was doing if I was right. dealing drugs or what. <laughs> right. And I mean, and of course, I'm just a shy, you know, goofy kid, but I would never be dealing drugs. But uh, they didn't know, and I and I told and. I'm like, oh, my God, if I tell them the truth, I'm going to be in trouble because they told me I'm not going to get a motor. You know, they don't want me on one. Well, I did. I said, I, said, I want to get a motorcycle, and I'm saving for it. And Well, I got grounded, and, and uh, you, you know, just do your work, get home, do, do your chores, and that's it, and no social life for you. And, okay, okay, I'm thinking to myself, God, I lost, I lost the money I saved, and I'm not getting a motorcycle. This is, this is really a raw deal. Well, they got with all my relatives, and... Um, uh, and ended up buying me a motorcycle, uh, and uh, that's what started all. I started racing and Riverside International Raceway, the Great Bear Grand Prix. If you ever remember any of those Grand Prix races, yeah, there was like three thousand motorcycles. Yeah, that was, was my crazy. first race. It's pretty wild, you know. Yeah, that was such a magical track, you know, because it was right in the middle of the city. You know, it yeah. was like I mean, it wasn't as built up as it is now, but it wasn't like you didn't have to make this big trek to go out to a track. Yeah. It was right there. Oh, and, and the character yeah. was just amazing. Uh, and I think even for the stock car guys, the character, uh, just the different, you know, it was a road course that had a huge bank corner, like one of the super speedways. And now, there's nothing like that. I mean, they don't have that going on. They, they've they turned some of the big ovals into some road courses, but nothing like Riverside. And so, But for us, you know, they had they had these desert races there, and we would, we would race on the asphalt, and then we'd go out in the go out in the fields and everything, all the, the acres and acres all around there and race around there too. And, uh, and I, I remember getting a, I think I got a second or a third, my first race in the beginner class. And, and then we were, I was hooked. My parents were hooked. You know, they were my biggest fan. Then my brother's been my biggest supporter my whole life. Uh, amazing what he's done because at that point he, he's five years, he's five years ahead of me. And he, um, uh, had a good job and everything. So he just started spending money on motorcycles for me. And, uh, and so then I s went from there, you know. Yeah, and then how did you make the transition from bikes into four wheel vehicles? Well, that was that was interesting because uh, so I um, was running motorcycles for quite a while, and uh, 
and we had everybody you got your little click that you ride with and everything and so uh uh i was in the 125 class and doing really successful and then i was getting big i was sprouting up to six four and getting too big to ride a 125 and i was going to get a 250 and so uh anyway one of the guys in our in our clique uh in our group in those desert races back in those district 38 you know yep. um those things, uh, I think FUD started all that, you know, District 30. Yeah, in yeah. East County, yep. yep. And so, anyway, they used to have a smoke bomb, and you'd have to go, like, a uh, half mile to the smoke bomb, and then they started the Mark course. Well, everybody had their own little way to get there, and a lot of times, if the line was right here, we would go hard right and go a few hundred yards down here, catch a wash, and, you know, we knew we knew that desert backwards and forwards, our whole group. And uh, make a long story short, a friend of mine, didn't show up after the race and we we're like going hey where's you know where's mike and and uh well his uh they did the sweep crew still didn't show up still didn't show up and so uh found out that he he had got off hard and killed you know and he, and he died out there and so it kind of set me back and i wasn't sure what i want to do i i was too young to be able to digest a friend of mine dying you know and so took a step back from it i had had my 250 and uh just got it and i raced it one time just to make sure I could, and then then got out of it. So we were then we were pitting for Jim Connors and a few others. And my brother decided, 1980, he drove by this used car lot, and there's a Class Eight, just a pretty pretty basic Class Eight Ford or whatever there. And he's, I'm gonna buy that. We're gonna go race the Baja 500. Well, that's how that started. <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, we finished fifth, and it was crazy. You know, that was like a win to us. That's such a that's such a you know, East County thing, right? There's a race truck at a used car lot. And that, that I remember at that as a kid of being like a regular thing in El Cajon, you drive by car lots. There was class five buggies, like whatever, yeah. you know, cause people would run out of money and, and then, and they'd sell their, their race car, their play car or whatever. Yeah. Um, no, I, I remember begging my dad. There's a, there's a Cheneth and I'm like, dad, you know, and he's like, yeah, no, it's not going <laughs> to happen. Right. Yeah. But uh, no, so then you guys started racing class eight. Well, we yeah we were in class we raced class eight and well that truck kind of got destroyed in the five hundred and so then we had met Ted Kendall uh, which had uh, done built a lot of the JD brand trucks and was and him and Steve Spierkoff, uh were all in, you know involved in all that and if people that people that are in the know know those names and and um, so he started building us a brand new truck and we there again we didn't have a big checkbook so it took us two years to build it. And so uh, uh, we put all our, moved from apartment. We both were living in apartments at that time. My brother and I, we both moved back home. My, my dad said, you know, if you're into this uh, enough, he says, you can live here for free. And, but we want this your only focus. You know, we don't want you wandering off and being this, being a partial focus and, and chasing girls in the bar, another focus or something. And so <laughs> Anyway, so we yeah we got totally into it, and after a few years, we built this truck and we went out and raced the Mint 400, and um, the truck was state of the art. It was on the cover of Off Road Magazine, and it was just it was beautiful. But we didn't have a super good engine in it. We didn't the components we couldn't afford the really expensive components, and and then we lost tranny in the first race, but we didn't have a spare, so we're out of that. And we race it again, and and uh, something else happens, and we just realized that wow, this is more expensive to race it than it is to build it. And we thought building it was expensive. So that's how a fantastic relationship started is we end up selling the truck and we sold it to the team that uh, Frank Vessels uh, was driving for. Hmm. And so Frank, for whatever reason, took a liking to these two geeky kids, you know, and and my brother and I, and, and uh, we decided we were going to build a 7S. But in the meantime, uh, and that was going to take a little time, obviously, uh, we were going to hang out with him. Well, you know, I, he was one of my idols. I mean, Scoop is amazing. And so I, I took and I'd sit there and talk to him and say, okay, well, how, you know, how, how do you get so good? How do you, you know, and just physically asking him questions because I felt so comfortable. I never felt more comfortable with anybody. And he goes, he says, oh, you got to, he says, uh, he says, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you one thing and I want you to remember your whole career or whatever. And I said, what's that? And he says, you got to get the thing in high gear. Anytime you can for, you know, just work at it and get it into high gear. And then, and then 
you know, don't let it fall off, don't let it lug, but just keep it in high gear and you'll, you'll eventually be going so, you know, fast enough to pull high gear. But if you race around in second gear and think you're some sort of racer and revving the motors and stuff, you're not going nowhere. And that really stuck with me. It was huge. Sure. So my whole career, I've always been, get that thing in high gear out here in the short course, desert racing, all of it. And, um, uh, but Scoop was just, it was a neat friendship, uh, loved, loved hanging out with him and, and, um, So Mitch, why is this bike so drippy? It's our 23 race bike. We can start up front, work our way to the back. Bones can tell you about the suspension. The rear shock is one of the most critical parts of the bike. Pegs with the titanium mounts. Kashima coating here. Anti-gravity lightweight battery. Young's modulus. Horse and a half. Works, Works chassis lab. More tie than a space shuttle. Really? I might need that repeated. This thing slaps. Slaps. Oh, you should have told me that earlier. So we, we built this 7S, and now all of a sudden we built a truck that uh, that we was it was a real fast competitive truck. It was the first shot first truck in its class that had two shocks per wheel. They were Ricky Deutsch with Deutsch Tech was a good friend of mine, and he's just started he just started his company, and he says, "Hey, I I want to put two shocks per wheel on that truck you're building." I go, "No, everybody's got three and four of these two inch you know little shocks and ranch or uh, ranchos or rough countries or whatever they are." And, so no, no, I want to. nuts back in the day too. Yeah. Yep. So he said, I said, well, you know, he, I'm going to put a bigger shock on. I said, how are you going to do that? He says, I'm, I've got these tr semi truck shock bodies from Monroe, and um, uh, and I'm going to use the big piston and use the, you know, and we're going to do two per wheel, and it's going to be better because they're more oil, you know, better valving, and so that's uh, that's where it all started on that, and uh, the or on our end or you know and everybody we go to the first race everybody goes oh that'll never work two shocks well scoop in at that point wasn't raised he, he the ride went away if he was riding he didn't have a ride that year and he says i'll drive that thing with you this is a parker 400 and um i ran the california side he was going to run the arizona side and i still have a paint pictures of the paint job with scott douglas frank vessels i'll cherish that forever you know right and um uh, we had a big lead, and, and uh, unfortunately, right near the end of the California side, the thing just threw a rod, and I don't know why. Uh, I really, I mean, I, I know Nate Joel's saying, sure, but I really wasn't running it hard. We had like a 20-minute lead, and he goes, just bring it to end, and we're going to win this thing. Well, anyway, I'm getting off track, but uh, that's how I got in the 7S days and, and then started getting successful. Won my first race, I think, in, in 84, Firecracker 250 in Barstow. Where you're going to have a rate, you know, yeah, at, yeah. California 300 yeah. course, yep. yeah, sweet, a lot of history there, man, a lot of history, and and what a neat area. I yeah. mean, it has all kinds of different trains. Uh, it's it's one of these things like it's funny because y you've raced on it, so you know, right? Yeah, and uh, we we were just out there and did a lap around it, and uh, honestly, I think that this is the best course in America because of the diversity of the terrain. It's got technical stuff, it's got rough stuff, it's got you know, multi-braided lines that you can go past and, and and get wide open on. And then, of course, the, the moon hills, right? Yeah, canyons and stuff. And yeah, yeah, so. yeah. Yeah. No, it, it's cool. So, uh, yeah, but we, we uh, I, I don't know. I just had a blessed career, man. I, there's so many stories. My head gets mixed up. I start spinning. <laughs> <laughs> well, earlier you were, you were saying that, like, was it, you, yeah, you were racing Class 7, and I think you were racing, uh, you, you were in a tie for the points championship with Rob Mack, or you guys yeah, were neck and neck, right? right? Right. Going into the thousand. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, it was one of the years where Sal was like, hey, there's this shortcut and everybody can take it. But, you know, it's what, you know, five it, mile silt bed or something it, crazy? It was longer than that. No, it was like about a 20 mile silt bed. <laughs> it was crazy amount of silt. And uh, if, you, if you made it, you're going to save about 35 minutes but um you're rolling was, the dice you're really rolling the dice where there was only a handful of people that took it and um uh and so how the race unfolded is like i said whoever rob and i were championship whoever finished ahead of the other one we're going to win and we really won a championship bad and so uh we were all hungry and a bunch of kids and and so took and took off and and rob uh you know, I was pacing Rob about five minutes back, and then he took and he jumped this lead to from five minutes to about fifteen or twenty minutes, and I was like, "How? What do? What do he do? You know, it's crazy." <laughs> and I'm running hard and fast, and and uh, 
So, man, I got to that shortcut, and I says, I got to take it. You know, I got to take it. I got to make this time up. I got to, if I can wind up back in front of him, well, then he's got to work hard because he's got to pass me and put time on me, you know. And so um, I took it, and I make going through there, going through there, and Jeff Howe was riding with me at the time. He's ridden, he's been with my career my whole life, you know, almost. And and uh, we had a big parameter. We were into you know, and the, our engine builder says, if that thing doesn't get over 1,200 degrees, you're going to be good. I says, well, you just keep that. And if it gets over 1,200 degrees, I'm going to have to lift. It didn't. It didn't. But at the end, we started smelling antifreeze. So it lost a head gasket. And we were, ah, oh, got it. And so we limped it to the next pit. And the chase crews took my hours to get in. And, well, in the meantime, Rob, Rob was told that we took it. His crew said, Scott took that shortcut and everything. And, and uh, he freaked because he knew he had pre-ran it. And he hit a rock. Uh, size of a Volkswagen, they say, and, and tore the whole rear end housing out of the truck. And so they came out there, and they didn't know how they were going to fix it. And uh, uh, they ended up taking a rear end housing, I guess, out of a chase truck, out of one of the stockers, and he limped it on in. Well, we fixed our head gasket and limped it all in, and the next, this was the next morning. He finished about 20 minutes ahead of me, won the championship. But what came out of that whole year was pretty amazing uh, as Walker... Evans, you know, Walker and his team, they, Phyllis, they had, uh, they had their eyes on me, I guess, and I had no idea, you know, and uh, he calls me up Christmas Eve and, and says, uh, and says, hey, I want to, you know, I want to hire you. And I says, really? And there's even a little bit more story to that. And so he, he uh, takes and, and he says, uh, I met my parents' house, and that's where he called. And he says, uh, he says, well, yeah, I, I, want, I got an opening. I, I want to kill two birds, one stone, get you out of, off of Rob's butt and put you in another class. And, and that's unfortunately when Evan had his accident, I was going to be replacing Evan. Right. You know, and so uh, uh, I was like, wow, you know, and he says, yeah, you know, get you fitted for driving suits and do this and do that. And, man, it sounds cool. And I said, and uh, I says, well, why? he says, well, what do you think? You know, come down and we talk about it some more. And I says, ah, don't know, you know. And I, he says, what do you mean you don't know? I says, I think i got to turn you down. And he goes, turn me down? I said, yeah. And um, I says, I made this deal with, I got this deal next year with B.F. Goodrich, you know. And, and um, he says, you do? And I says, yeah. And, and so uh, I says, I, yeah, I did this contract, and I, and I can't let them down. I, you know, my, and so he says, well, why don't, you know, let's just sit on it and call me back, whatever. So I hung up the phone. And my dad was eavesdropping. You know, my parents were eavesdropping on me. And <laughs> my dad goes, well, so what was that all about? I says, well, I was talking to Walker and this. And he says, yeah. And he says, he wanted to hire me. And he says, what did you tell him? I says, I told him no. And he says, well, why did you tell him no? You know, because they knew this was my dream. This is right. what I wanted. I says, dad, I says, you told me your words, the only thing you've got in life. And, and I says, and I gave BFG my word. And he says, well, maybe I left something out. <laughs> and... Um, he says, I tell you what, he says, you know, you go and you call him back and set up a meeting and you go meet with him in person. If you're going to turn him down, you turn him down in person, not over the phone, first of all. He says, you think about what you want to do. He didn't tell me what to do, how to do it. So I go to this meeting with Walker and Phyllis and I had a week to set it all up. And I wrote all these notes down that, oh, yeah, you know, I want this and maybe this bonus and this and that. I'm starting to, I'm starting to get big-headed. I won a few races, and <laughs> I'm feeling good. Walker Evans called me for a job. And right. I got, I, so my brother was involved, and they go, absolutely, we want your brother. So he came to the meeting, too, and we sat down on their dining room table, and I have this folder sitting here, you know, and I'm going to pull out these notes. And, well, Walker starts saying, well, we're going to, you know, you're going to be in this truck, and, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do that, and this is your this is how much you're going to make, and this is your bonus schedule, and we're got to get you fitted for a couple of driving suits, and get you two or three helmets, and all all your gear, all your stuff, all of us, and and um, and then you're going to go down to Dodge and pick out what kind of vehicle you want, and you get a loaner vehicle every year, just pick a new one. And I'm just taking this folder and pulling it off the table and putting it under my chair <laughs> as slick as I can because this is more than I ever could imagined, you yeah. know. And, uh, and then I told, he goes, well, I says, yeah, that sounds pretty awesome. I think, I think I want to do it. He goes, well, why did you turn me down before? And so I told him the story that, you know, I had made a deal with BF Goodrich and it was Frank D'Angelo some of his first years. He was only involved. I think it was only his second year. He was a truck driver before he was running the program. Right. Bob Bauer was, you know, running it before that. And, and, um, he says, you know, and this is before cell phones. He goes, I've got Frank's number. You mind if I call him? And he had a speakerphone, you know, that he had on the front of his and 
he dials up and he says, hey, and Frank answers. I'm going, he's got Frank's number. <laughs> I don't have Frank's number at home, right. you know, and, and, uh, but it's Walker Evans. You got to understand. And he calls up. He says, hey, I got Scott Douglas here. And, and so to make a long story short, he says, uh, he, he wants, he is not sure if, you know, he can drive for me because he has a contract with you. And, and it was only a small little deal, you know. It was, but still, it was your word, right? Right. And so we, uh, we, you know, he, Frank goes, you know what? He says, I want to tell you, he says, this is a career decision for you. And he says, we can't hold you back. And he yeah. says, uh, I'd be more than happy. And I tell you, and I still have the letter that got written to release me from that, you know, and it was a defining moment in my life because I thought it was going to be two or three years and I go back to construction. And here I'm now talking to you, you know, you know, 35 years later and, and, uh, pretty sweet. <laughs> yeah. No, it is. And it's pretty fateful that like, you know, in in you know nearly beating his driver right he saw the value in you you know what i mean right and went okay you know here's a guy that can wheel and and become something and then you know giving you the shot and because obviously you know he didn't get that uh walker didn't right right he had, he had to build that program and right. uh, the other tire company you're talking about at that time was goodyear right yeah and they yeah. for for a long time they supported them and, and spent a lot of money and then they went out of off road yeah. racing. Yeah, no, they were one of some of his biggest supporters and and uh, for the older people that know, Little Joe was was uh, was the guy for Goodyear and really good guy and they were they were good people, you know. And uh, I felt bad leaving BF Goodrich, but I still was in my infancy in my career, and this was like Frank said, a career move. I mean, we still they stayed in touch and soon yeah. as i had the opportunity i was back on him which which was soon that's another leads to another good story about um after walker i drove for walker for three years and then um and then uh or yeah three years and then uh herzogs kept uh hounding me and um uh and wanted me to drive for them and and i had this gig with walker going really good winning championships winning all the races just you know, dominate the classes they were putting me in and the vehicles they were putting me in. And, right. And so, uh, but they, uh, Herzogs were, were, it was pretty crazy. They wanted me, and actually it went back to Ted Kendall, my crew chief, well, uh, the one who built our original Class 8. Well, he was working for Herzogs uh, on some of their programs, and um, they had won their first race that year. Right. Uh, and then uh, the year that, that they were in 92 before I drove for him and they they said you know they asked him and he was pretty he's always been blunt you know? right and uh he says hey you know we want to race and he says but now we want to win a championship and he goes he goes you want to win a championship you better get Scotty you know and and uh it was it's really a honor and it's, and it's awesome to hear him tell that story you know and uh, and so they hounded me, and, and they found out when my contract expired with Walker and the day it expired I had a FedEx package uh, at my doorstep with a first class plane ticket to to Missouri uh, to their office. Nice. And I flew back and and that's how that deal got put together and and that's you know there's a lot of stories about that Herzog Ranger uh, 7S is only only one uh, myself and that truck and that team uh, we won the only one to ever win an overall in a seven car and I don't think it'll ever be duplicated you know and no uh, just a perfect day you know yeah so. All right, Chase, number 23, it's 2023. This championship's yours. Let's show these guys what's up. Easy, boys. It's not over yet. Big dog still got to eat. <laughs> Whatever you say, big dog. Seriously? These fools think I'm fried? They know the deal. No, that, that, that was huge, and it was interesting in... in in that era and how the the factories were involved and you know there was a lot of um a lot of momentum and yeah. and so at what point did you transfer over into short course well it was it was soon after that and i'll tell you the reason why is that uh marty reed was doing a lot of the tv productions and right. i'm not sure if it was speed channel then or not but uh, out in the desert, and they they were doing a good job. I mean, for the you know yeah. how hard it is to cover the desert, and he have he'd have you know five or six helicopters and a bunch of stationary cameras and all this stuff, and 
and you of all people probably would respect this, <laughs> how hard this is to do because we're doing, you know, how hard it is to film the mint and everything. And, and uh, so he, you know, they would ruin a camera or two every, you know, time. And those are expensive. You yeah, know? back and, then they were, they were sh- yeah. a lot of them were shooting on film. Some of it was a uh, hybrid tape. But uh, it was expensive, and yeah. the, the equipment was expensive. The lenses were expensive. So yeah, then he's got to take all this footage he has of these in cars and and all this other stuff, and he's got to put it all together. And I that was hours and hours worth work, I'm sure. Yeah, days probably. <clears throat> yeah, and so he he had came out here a couple of times to Crandon here uh, to watch Walker run. Walker just came out a few times and ran and ran out here with his Class Eight with a desert car and. And um, and really did good and loved this place and everybody welcomed him and Jack Flannery and him got to be good buddies and well, um, they were doing they were gonna do out here they were really gonna ramp up their series and do a better series and and he started talking to him and going how about we film it put it on Speed Vision or whatever channel it was and yeah they were like holy smokes yeah and because he was looking at I can take seven cameras stationary and get more footage than I ever yeah. need. And not one of them will get damaged, and we can all be staying at a hotel. Yeah. You know, and we won't be out in the middle yeah, of filming, desert. Filming short course is way easier than filming desert, yeah. for yes. And so he left with the T. And so all of a sudden, the sponsors all went, if the TV's leaving, what are we going to do? So uh, Walker Walker made the commitment that he was going to he was gonna do a, the full-time series. And so Herzog said, hey, we need to do this. So we end up buying... Walker's old, he was building a new short course purpose truck. And we, uh, so we bought the one he was racing. Herzog's did. Which was a desert <coughs> truck. To a be desert like, truck yeah. that got converted, so yeah. 7S, basically. But no, this was an 8. Class okay, 8. It was yeah, this was a class 8. Yep. And big B1, uh, crazy, uh, crazy, crazy trucks. And it was funny, we were we were talking a few years ago about DOT tires. And, and, I'm, and personally, I'm glad they went to them. I think it gets more manufacturers back involved. Sure. But, another subject another day but we were running uh, uh 900 to a thousand horsepower there was no cubic inch limits and we were running 630 inch big block b1s uh with dual like jack had dual dominators 1150 carburetors i mean we had one big single one uh these were drag race motors almost it was crazy the amount of power on 33s oh man on dot 33s <laughs> with a truck that weighed Probably eight thousand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I knew it could be done. We did it, and with no, with the suspension travel, isn't anything like yeah. that, you know. And so um, UTVs, by the way, are going to thirty fives now. Yeah, <laughs> That's yeah exactly. So crazy. Yeah, exactly. That's <clears throat> something. So. Uh, Anyway, uh, uh, so that's how I ended up short course, and I ended, my first year was was in, and I took in, uh, and it was a unique year. Uh, this is something else I don't think anybody's ever done, and and I at the time, you know, being a young kid. You really thought this was the best the best thing that ever could happen to you right. as a as a new driver and well wa- uh, it was my second year with Herzogs and and they came out here and we're going to run short course instead of the desert now ninety four and the trophy truck series had started up out out west and so Walker had a second trophy truck and he so they called me up he says hey I know you're going to do that short course with Herzogs but uh, we want you to we want you to drive our trophy truck. Right. And so I had two bosses that year. The, and I thought, well, this is this is the best thing ever. Right. You know? Until you realize that in short course, your arch competition, your biggest competitor, arch enemy, so to speak, is going to be your boss in the desert. Yeah. That was a little tough at times. That, that had to have been strange. <laughs> yeah, it was. Because I... We were beating fenders and flipping each other over and crashing in each other, and then Monday I'd be back at the shop working there on the trophy truck, getting it ready, and ah, it was strange, but good times. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And then you know, at that point, Walker was still racing, right? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. He raced quite a he raced quite a few years in. Uh, um, yeah, definitely. I think it was. It had to be. 2010 when he quit or something. I mean, it was, it was, yeah. he went, you know, and maybe even longer. I'm not even sure of the dates, but, um, but yeah, he, he ran a long time. And, you know, Walker's, and he's a tenacious, uh, tough competitor. And, yeah, to say and, the least. Yeah. And, uh, he, uh, you know, it, but part of that, I don't know if people give it enough credit. And I'm glad that Randy made it into Hall of Fame as oh, well. Yeah. But, but you, uh, Randy, 
uh, with Walker, he was he was the he wasn't just the glue that kept it together. He won't ever give himself credit, but he was a good crew chief is more than a guy that can set up suspension and work on shocks and all yeah. this stuff. It's a guy that believes in the driver. Totally. And he's a, and it's just no different than a football coach. And my good crew chiefs is some of one of the crew chiefs that I really throughout my year, some of them that I really cherish are the ones that were super good coaches for myself and the team. Kept us all on a high. We're going to win. We're going to this is why we're and then when things went wrong, like if you've ever gone back and looked at interviews with Walker, you know, and he is a fabulous driver, but he's never done anything wrong. <laughs> it's right. always the truck broke or this sure. or that. And don't get me wrong, it, most of the case, that's the truth. But there has been, we all make mistakes. I've made a ton of them, right. you know, and uh, some real foolish ones. <laughs> and anyway, uh, but Randy'd come through and say, no, 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 this, you know, uh, you know, I didn't have the shock set up right or, or this broke or that broke. And uh, Walker would have won that rate. Walker would have always put it in the back of everybody else's head that, or Randy would have that Walker would have won that race, and that's that's what a good sure. cheerleader. And so when I drove for those guys, he extended that to the whole team. We never wanted to let him down, and and it made me, you know, I was always driving harder and everything. So, uh, but that's part of Walker's legacy, and and I'm glad that you know they. I think everybody within that organization really understands that chemistry and and how it all came about. Yeah, it's interesting too, though, to see like, you know the companies that then were born out of that era, right? Like oh, yeah. obviously Walker's company that did, you know, shocks and tires and they just recently got purchased by Polaris. So it's like this whole thing's still rolling forward, right? Yeah, but you look at look at the lives that they set in a path. You know, yeah. my mind, for example, unbelievable. I mean, they're the ones who set that in motion. Yeah. Kevin Croyer. Yeah. Uh when I drove for Walker, you know, back in the early years in the 90s kevin croyer was our engine builder and he was just in the back building engines yeah and, and he and but uh, just you know, super smart super smart yeah uh jeff geyser was my co-writer in the trophy truck oh and really yes oh yeah man jamming jeff <laughs> and uh <laughs> unbelievable uh, uh superman i tell you what that guy i love him but uh look at his career and, and it just goes on and on and i mean i'm just picking out a few right and uh uh i I mean, if I thought about it, I probably could pick out ten that made careers out of this. And how, and there's not a lot of people making careers out of off-road racing. It's all right. about. It's more about the passion and the love for the sport. I'm fortunate enough to do it for a living, and like I said, there's only a handful that was able to do that. Well, yeah, I agree. And look, I know there's probably a million memories, right? Like throughout your career, really cool different things. But you know, it, was there one you know that you kind of remember where you know great, you're doing this for a living now, but then you became a champion. And there, there was there that moment where you're like, man, I'm, I'm good at this. Like, I'm actually the best. Well, I don't know if it ever got to that point. Um, uh, but, I, but it probably was here at Crandon, uh, you know, and it was probably uh, I had got my own team going again in 97. Russ Warnemont built me a chassis. And... Um, well, we won the championship that year, and after winning the championship, uh, the uh, well, the cup race was here too, the Borg Warner Cup, yep. and we entered that and uh, and and won that, and just uh, that was a that was a pretty big defining moment. You now, I would say that was one. Another one, both of them here, right at Crandon. I mean, memories are made here at Crandon. It's crazy. Absolutely. But uh, 2006, um, I took and and. Uh, uh, or 2008, yeah, 2008. I'm okay. I was here, and I was racing Pro Two and Pro Four, and uh, we went out and practiced, and we were fast time. We qualified fast. We won the Pro Four race. I ran the Pro Two race. Now the Pro Two at this time was a converted Pro Four. Right, it was an old Pro Four that you were allowed to have tube chassis. As last year, you have tube chassis. So we took the front end, front drive out. Everybody says this is never going to work, but I had. I had two sponsors that wanted to sponsor me, and I and so I well, this is a perfect solution. I'll run two trucks, you know. Right. And uh, as the first year when Amzo came on, but then I still had Rancho and Dynamax that was a long time sponsor as well, and they they wanted to cut back, so it was perfect to fit them in the Pro Two. Well, I came out and got a second in the Pro Two, and then won the Pro Four race, and then the next day won the Pro Four race and got a third in the Pro Two, and then uh, went out and and just dominated the Cup. And uh, I was the first one to 
you know, podium five times at Crandon. And at that point, you – In a weekend. In a weekend. Yeah. First time in one weekend – Five times. Every time, every time I, I put the driving the helmet on, I podiumed, and um, it was pretty surreal to come up here in front of forty thousand people and all that stuff, and, and getting the trophies and everything, and just and those people were, they were such believers in you. You could tell they were the fans, the the energy from the fans was just bleeding off. Uh, and at that moment, I really went, wow, I think I am somebody. I think I, you know, I think I made this deal. I, I might be able to do this. <laughs> <laughs> Racing against your dad is something that 90% of the racers in the world will never get. I've accomplished everything I wanted to do, and now he's just like taking the reins. I want to be remembered for being a, a, a huge part of short course, not just racing, keeping it alive, helping it grow. If it comes down to the last weekend and I'm in it, the boys better watch out. <laughs> No, that's cool. Like, you know, uh, something I talk about, is your generation isn't, like, you know, very boastful. You're not, like, the social media guys who are, like, let's get a selfie and, you know, yeah. all this kind of stuff. So I think it's very important to, you know, recognize those moments. And I'm, I'm really glad that you're getting inducted in the Hall of Fame because a lot of times, <clears throat> you know, it's the squeaky wheel, right? That gets all the attention, Right. right. And there's a lot of people like yourself, like Scott Taylor, um, who, you know, have done the work, right? And have, right. have won the races. And, you know, and you in particular, it's, it's, I love hearing these stories because everybody knows you as the short course guy, right? But they yeah. don't know the, the back history of, of how you got to that point, right? right? And uh, I think it's cool because I think that um, there's a lot of people that can relate to it and go like, huh, well, you know. I'm I'm about the same. Maybe I could do this. Yeah, and and I and I hope uh, people have that same will and ambition. Uh, I will say it's a lot harder. We had great opportunities with so many manufacturers and so many opportunities. Uh, not very many professional driving job opportunities, but sponsor opportunities, which could lead into a lot of things. But uh, it's harder now, and I think. Uh, social media has been fantastic in some ways of keeping people informed. In other ways, it's really, it's really put the hurts on things because back in my day, you had to have, if you were good at interviews and and got TV time, and and uh, and good at doing interviews for for uh, magazines and stuff. Yeah. And they liked what you said, and you had interesting stories. They print it, and the more you got your stuff printed, the more Ford and BF Goodrich and all these people wanted you to drive for them. It wasn't about all the race wins and yeah. stuff. Those opportunities now, there's so much out there that it's all diluted a little bit, I feel. Yeah. But, um, you know, and at the end, how I wanted to end my career, that my career didn't completely end. I have no regrets, and, I, and I'm so thankful for everything I have and no complaints either. I want to make that completely clear. But I really was gearing up. I had three trucks at the end, and, I, you know, I leased them out sometimes to different people at Snow Rush and this and that. But the reason I had that was I wanted to be the guy who – got a sponsor and could put a young Keegan Kincaid or, a, or, or somebody like that, um, you know, uh, Doug Matag or these guys that have, um, you know, unbelievable talent and, and like Matag, you know, I, you know, and some, and there's a lot of other ones that, are, that have just shown it and they've never had that break. Yeah. And I wanted to be that guy and I could, that's one of the things I couldn't put together at the end. And I finally had to just give up on that dream and say, okay, well, I just got to shut this down and, because there just wasn't enough money to sure. to go around, and things got so expensive. So yeah, and it, it was on a downswing, you yeah. know. Yeah. So like we were having all those challenges, but like it was also for you. It was also you know sure it would have been nice for you to transfer all that knowledge, but you did because I know that you've helped quite a few yeah. people, right? Because I I, yeah. I I would hear all these stories about people going to your shop or you helping them with setup. You know why did you do that? I I just. Uh, I want to beat the the person. I mean, I guess it's just in some people's DNA. Other people go, I want to win at any cost, and and if I can have a better this or better that. Don't get me wrong. We we try. I mean, we within rules, we did everything we could do in our power to have the best truck out there. But right. I wanted everybody else to have the best truck out there, and the reason being because if this if those other guys, if I'm going out there and winning all the time, well it doesn't 
it doesn't help the sport. It doesn't bring the sport up. And we need to bring the sport up everybody. I only need to win by a foot. And those are the best wins. You know, these ones that you that you win because you just dominate and you've got, you know, so you go to these other, you know, you say, hey, I'll, you know, let me help you with this. And I mean, when Johnny Greaves first started uh, Pro 4, he, you know, and, and he did a lot of great things for me too. I got to say, you know, helped me out on a lot of projects and different things. And, but he was struggling and with his, he has run a manual gearbox and I was running a manual gearbox back then. Right. And, um, uh, in Rod Millen was the one who introduced it, uh, the manual gearbox into the sport. And I had bought my stuff from him. So I knew what the ratios were. And I, and I, and I looked at the stack up and I go, man, this is really odd. Cause it wasn't a traditional stack ratio where first was high. And then, you know, second was a little, little closer and third and then you know, fourth, fifth was super tight. Yeah. It was first and second were real tight. Right. And then, and I never could figure it out. So I tried my own stack and then I go back to this gearbox that I bought from Rod and man, it was fast because you, the wheel spin, what they, what they real, you know, they found out, they learned is when you have the wheel spin down low, you got to have a real tight ratio. Well, right. Well, John couldn't figure that out either. He, he kept struggling with the gearboxes and breaking them and had these big, man, I, it won't pull gears. And I finally went over and said, try this stack. Right. And it was amazing. He was winning. <laughs> and uh, shortly after that, and, and he was appreciative, but it was almost like, man, what did I start here? Because <laughs> I mean, this guy, uh, this, this guy's uh, on it, you know, and, and, uh, and we end up, he ended up being one of my arch rivals and we, yeah, We've gone back and forth. Well, but, we'll talk about know. that. I mean, so cool. You help him out. And then, I, you know, I was here for that that era. And, like, the battles were just spectacular. Right. It was just, like, knockdown, drag out, you know. And I remember, what was the name of the announcer here that was? Um, he Scott was, Rain, I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, Scott. That's right. Uh, uh, but, no, there was another guy uh, as well who was just, like, they were always going crazy. And I just remember, you know, they were, like, Douglas is in front. No, no you know, now yeah. Greaves is in front. Right. You know, and okay, wait, no, wait, switched again, right? And it that was a lap. Right. That was just one right. lap, right? right? And you and you still had 15 laps to go, and everybody's just like, oh my God. Yeah. You know, these guys are ready to kill each other. Yeah. You know, and and really put it all out there. And it just super exciting racing and right. you know, and the fans going berserk, you know. Yeah. Some really good racing. Uh, the and, energy was yeah. the energy was incredible, and it's funny because you know being a filmmaker as well, we're always trying to transfer that, right? right? But there's only a certain amount of kinetic energy that we can get across through film, right? And I always tell people like, this is a little taste of it. You got to go there, and you gotta you gotta feel it. You gotta smell it. You know, you gotta feel it in your chest. You know, the trucks coming around the track here, and and you know, it's visceral. Like it's yeah. completely visceral. Yeah, yeah. No, it is. It's wild, and we had battles, and and we didn't always get along. We actually, <laughs> there's sometimes we really, and I'm I'm mild mannered. I'm, uh, but when I get when I get pushed over the edge, it's zero to sixty or zero sure. to hundred. It's it's I, I'm I can't even control myself at that point. And I used to like if I ever got wronged on the track where I felt I got wronged and and this and that and the you know I talked to the officials and. And uh, I, I don't know why I did this, but I felt compelled to. But I said, uh, I, you know, they'd say, well, I know you guys had this incident and all this stuff. And I said, yeah. I said, and he says, you know, you good with that? And I says, yeah, I'm real good with that. I says, I'm just going to go take him out next race. I tell the officials that before the race. <laughs> they'd be watching. I'd do it, and I'd get a black flag. Yeah. And I, I don't know why I was compelled. To, but I, and I was compelled to – I felt we, we, you know, need to even the score, but – those situations, uh, some of them I really regret because some of them get way out of control. Uh, yeah. And some of them you look back and you go, mm, it was more questionable than you thought. You know, you always, sure. when you're in that seat uh, and, and you're, you're working so hard, uh, it's, it's pretty crazy. But John and I have had some great battles. And as far as helping out, he, he, uh, he built a chassis for me in 2006. And, yeah. and um, uh, we had to tune it and do a few things, but... He he kicked himself in the butt and he didn't build another one for anybody else. Yeah, because uh, we were we were the him and I we were battling uh, and he's like I'm getting beat with my own truck. Right, you know and and uh, yeah well don't well, know what to tell you. I also think that too it's it's passion and it's emotional. You know it 
lots of different types of competition, um, you know, and I'm not downplaying any of them, but this one, you know, when you put so much into this and you, you, you know, you got to scrape together the sponsor dollars, you got to build the truck, you got to prep it, you got to truck it here, you know, you get here and you're like, you know, all right, it's all or nothing, right. you know, and also the pressure, right? Like everybody goes, oh, you know, there's, you know, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, we know the pressure. The pressure is right. you don't perform, those sponsors go away. Yeah. The the love from the crowd goes away. Right. You know what I mean? They're not here for non-performance. They're here. Right. They want to see guys, you know, getting wild and, and yelling at each other and putting, you know, putting it all on the line. And they want to see that passion. And you guys definitely delivered that passion. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. I, and I think, you know, I, I can only speak because, you know, I wasn't in the truck racing against you or racing with you. But what I saw was like, and then, you know, being a part of this culture and learning everything. And I'm like, you know, there is, it's do or die. You know, there is no like plan B like, oh, yeah, if this doesn't work out, I've got a you know, I don't know, a, a golf ball business, right. you know, there was right. no, no, we're, know, this is our life. This is it. Yeah. Right. And it was like, you know, especially too, when there was good times with, you know, a lot of uh, sponsorship and then there was, you know, lean times. Right. And, and so it's, it creates this weird ebb and flow where everybody's, you're looking at the guy and his sponsor and you're like, I want to talk to that guy. Right. Cause I, I just beat that guy. And right. if I can get, that you know another hundred grand for my program right. I, I can beat them consistently right right and that's still that's still true of of this sport is that you know and it's funny being now being on the uh promoter side and, and dealing with all the sponsors and and it's like they right. everybody has, like let's let's talk about monster everybody has leg humped monster like hey you need one right. more guy in your roster right uh, and they've spent a lot of money in this sport and, and continue to do so. And, and that's not a bad thing that people are leg hung, humping them. It's competition. That's right. part of the competition. But, right. yeah, I can only imagine what it felt like in the car when you got wronged. And you're like, man, I did all this, came all this way, spent, you know, whatever, tens of thousands of dollars, and this guy took me out? Right. All right. It's on, right. you know? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It it definitely uh, – that – and you you nailed you described it perfectly. Yeah. Uh, the passion builds, and and the other thing about the fans is <clears throat> not only you, you when you when you build a fan base, and and I had built a pretty good fan base here at Crandon. I still have. I mean, I, it's yeah. awesome coming here. Um, you just there's a certain part of you doesn't want to let these people down, and you're you're giving it. You know, you're giving it more than you realize. Sometimes you know the the fans. I'm I'm a type of guy that um, input and and uh, support. You know, the harder you support me, the more people I have supporting, the more people that I have around that believe in me, the harder I'm going to race. And yeah. uh, that's kind of been a lot of people aren't that way, but I am that kind of guy. I'm driven by by support. You know, and and I guess maybe I don't believe in myself a lot of times. You know, I'll still, you know, I used to watch Turn One and watch those guys come through turn one and there's no way, you know, and then, no, that's what I used to do, yeah. you know, or, and, uh, uh, and so anyway, but the passion here is, is great. Uh, I think as drivers, we need to, we need to do our best job. The competition yellow has made it fantastic for the fans and a neat deal, but in other ways it's, it's been a little tough because it, it's the second chance flag Yeah, and there shouldn't be second chances. And so, as not bunching everybody up is awesome, but if you got aggressive somehow or you blew a corner and tagged the wall and got a flatter, you, you, your day should be done. You yeah. made the mistake. You don't get a second chance. Yeah. And and I was the guy that I'm methodically you. I won most of my races by a foot. I'd have a half a lap lead, and just and everybody, you know. Everybody'd say, "Hey, you know, they're making up. You know, he's making up three seconds a lap on him. You know, and and uh, I ha I'd have a I'd have a uh, you know a twelve second lead. They're making up three seconds a lap. And there's three laps to go. Well, right. do the math. I'm doing it in my head. I'm not worried about it. But this truck, I'm gonna save it, and it's yeah. gonna make it. And um, if I had to turn it up, I would. That part of the strategy is more is some of the desert strategy. And even out in the desert, 
from what I'm talking to Rob and talking to people, a lot of that's out the window now. It's wide open yeah. stuff. But it's a shame because. But you're still you're still balancing. It's wide open, but you're still balancing saving the vehicle. Right. You know the the equipment's gotten a lot better. The the knowledge base has gotten better. It, it's not like the old days where it's like there's a handful of people that had the right equipment and the right knowledge yeah. base. Now there's that's readily available. I mean, hell, you can go buy a four wheel drive trophy truck. Right. You know, from Mason, it's right. you know if you have the money. So, right. uh, but continue. Sorry. <laughs> no, and that, that's that's exactly it. You know, and and we we uh, so you know, it, and you're right. Now it, it's 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 a bigger money game. Yeah. And and it's and it's more compact. Uh, and um, and with the short course stuff. Uh, with the comp, like I said, with the competition yellow, that second chance, it's cool for the fans and everything. And if you're in that position, it's awesome. If I get a flat, I mean, it's awesome. Uh, if I had to do it, I'd love to figure out a way to stack the field, but not have that second chance flag, sure. you know. And but it, there isn't a way, you know. You can't have life isn't perfect, so. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's got to be, I mean, was it frustrating for you when you're, you know, you, you've got a good position, you got a good start, you got a good position, and it's like, now they're going to put all these guys back on your ass. Right. And you and it's no different than what a NASCAR road race is right now. Yeah. A friggin' mess. Yeah. Let's be honest. Uh, it's a shame. The, those guys, you know, they, they put 10 wide into the corner. Well, I thought we were the only guys that did that, but now they're doing it. Yeah. And what is it? it? It's turned into a disaster. Well, and so that's kind of what happens with us a lot of times. The other thing that's interesting, and this is just perspective, and this comes to the, the research I've done with the Hall of Fame and what I've watched of myself and and uh, and putting tapes together for the induction ceremony. And well, like Riverside, the off-road track there at Riverside. Mm -hmm. If you watch a lot of those tapes, those. Did you notice how rough that track was? Oh, yeah. Unbelievable. And every time we try and make a short course track rough, you know, a lot of us, me included sometimes, oh, no, it's too rough, Ken. No, you need to figure out how to time things and how to time the doubles. And I watched that seven, I, I watched, they had a, somebody had some raw footage. It was on Hall of Fame stuff, but raw footage of the 7S race in, um, in 89. And uh, it showed, a, it, it showed, camera angles no no video it looked like like i said raw footage of everybody going by and all this stuff and we're taking these seven s's and we're doubling these big doubles and doubles and bouncing right. and you got to be over on this line and then hitting these moguls and that's the way it should be yeah i agree and uh i'm surprised i mean this track is unique and it's got its own character but i'd love to see somebody go out on a limb i know they don't want to do it because they're going to break a lot of tracks trucks we could have broke them all back in those days. Sure. It's all about throttle control and, and knowing now, if you can't run a track wide open, there's something wrong with a track builder. No, you should figure out, we should figure out no, where that, we, you know. I, I That's racecraft, right? And, yeah. I, and I agree with you. I remember those, those the heated arguments, and, and I was filming at the time, but I wasn't, you know, the promoter, so I didn't really have, like, a voice uh during the core era, right? And right. and it was really interesting observing it because, you know, there was a group of guys who was like, the the jumps need to be big, you know, the, the we need to showcase the vehicles. And I remember Ricky Johnson, and he was the guy who wanted everything uh, long and, and low, to, so it was fast. But part of that decision-making was his body was broken from years of motocross, and so he was like, man, this hurts, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I'm not, he's a good friend of mine, but that was his mindset. So yeah. he was pushing his agenda. Right. Right. And now years later, I can look at this at a more rounded way. And we were just talking to Keegan about the same thing. And like, yes, this track is unique. However, it could use some bigger jumps. Right. So, you know, these vehicles are so incredible and the, the drivers are so incredible. 
we we have to showcase that, right? Right. And, and I, again, like I remember the core days of all the buggy guys complaining about stuff, and I'm like, this isn't the track for you. The track is for the Pro Twos and Pro Fours, and if you right. can't double or triple what they're doing, that's okay. Check up and roll it. You know what does a class nine car do in the desert? Yeah, I mean, yeah, those guys aren't skipping over anything. No, you know, or or a class especially, eleven or a, especially I mean, now we have right. th- three and a half foot right. holes everywhere. Right. So, right? Uh, you know, and, and so it can be done. Yeah, uh, but that's the reason they don't is because it's uh, the argument has always been that we are such a diverse group of classes. Yeah. that you can't build a track for the. No fast guys and this well no the slow guys just got to go slow and if they go into their wide open they're gonna they're gonna crash and and you're right they won't look that exciting but i tell you what it would be to see the the limited buggies or whatever on a really rough course and to see yeah. who survived it'd be interesting yeah. because you got to save the gearbox you got to all that stuff you know <laughs> i already know the answer to that larry job would probably win every single <laughs> race right there yeah <laughs> because he's he's good at doing both but yeah it, you know, it's it's very interesting because, you know, we straddle between, you know, racing for the racers and then being entertainment, right? Right. And so you, you have to kind of have this perspective of like, okay, you know, what are we going to do here? And we're going through it right now with California 300. Um, we Our start finish is Barstow, Maine. And people have asked me like, oh, cool. Are you going to, are you going to, are you going to grade it out? No. I'm like, well, well those are huge holes. What, what about these vehicles? These vehicles, I'm like, they're going to have to roll through it because yeah. I'm not going to sacrifice what the unlimited trucks can do and the spectacle of, you know, 80, 100 miles an hour going through three and a half foot whoops. That is the magic, right? right. I'm not going to sacrifice that so everybody can get around it at speed. You know, you're just how ha- your, your vehicle will shine in other p- parts of the course, right? Right. And you race within your class. Yeah, you race within your class your class and your driving capabilities, right? Right. So Yeah. Yeah. No, and I and I so that we're getting a little off, but it is it's interesting that we share that same view and yep. and and I don't know if, you know, nobody has the answers to short course. I mean the biggest problem with the short course stuff is 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 the financial and getting the getting the manufacturers involved again have more heavily and uh and I don't I I've always you know, worked hard on trying to uh, to make that happen. I want I want to see, even though I'm not in the seat, I want to see this sport really work. I'm like you, I just want this thing. I come here and I want it successful, and I want these drivers getting their due and being able to get opportunities. And and um, I don't know if we'll get there, but hopefully we'll we'll get some manufacturer attention eventually. And they can. I know they've toyed around with different classes and. But when you change classes and change owner engine, engine packages and all this stuff, you, you're it costing money too. So sure. it it you never can please everybody. But uh, it's it's interesting. And and uh, I thought by now with the spec tire thing we would have a little bit more. But we do have quite a few more. At least people are getting they're getting a lot of free product and, and they're getting a little bit of money and it's working. You know it's working. But we haven't we haven't got that interest where Ford Motor Company or has went well. You know, uh, we want to go out and beat the Toyotas. And what what do we got to do? And when that happens, it's on. I, I think it's coming. You know, okay. and, and I think to to the credit to credit you guys, your generation. Um, you know, when you look at any other motorsport or you look at any other sport, it's not quick, right? I mean, right. even Formula One, like twenty years ago, they were you know, wives with stopwatches. It wasn't that long ago, right? Right. So that evolution has happened over X years, right? And so when you look at off-road racing in America, we're 50-something years old. We're not that old, right? So then when you compare that to the other motorsports that are bigger than us, right, Um, you know, they've been around longer, right? They've also done a better job, I think, of being organized and, and putting the package together putting that in front of, you know, the, the manufacturers and, and the non endemic sponsors. Um, but I think it's coming, you know, I, I could tell you from our side, the conversations changed, you know, when we got into, um, promotion on the promotion side, the narrative was like, Oh, they're going to shut the deserts down. Right. right now I got cities calling me going, Hey, would you like to do an off-road race here? Cause we sure would like the, the influx of, of right. economic impact. Yeah, and and so that it's a different it's a different game now, and I think 
you know, the other thing is that, you know, I keep giving this credit to Cranon on the Midwest people and the blue collar work ethic. That is America, right? And as cool as F1 is, right? And I like it. I think it's badass. Right. And I'm not, I'm not discounting it in any way, but like, that's not American. Right. Americans drive trucks and this sport is sells trucks. Right. I mean, the, the, the thing that we do constantly yeah. with sponsors and everybody is that I go, cool, come, you know, come to VIP and look at all the stuff and oh, it's bitching, right? right? But I go, come here, come out to our parking lot and look at all the F three fifties and the you know, the 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 uh RVs and you know, all right. the trailers and all that kind of stuff. I go, This is our audience, right? And this yeah. is what they're spending money on. Right. Whether it's the racers, the fans, you know, the sponsors you know, people that work at the track, like this is, they're spending money and that that's what we represent. So I, I hold, I think this has a lot more value uh, than people even understand. And part of that point of view is knowing the history of being there for, you know, Mickey Thompson, 60,000 people in, in a, in a stadium in, in San Diego, you can't, put 60,000 people in the stadium in San Diego if you have the biggest football game now, right? right? Because there's just too much going on. So just knowing that, knowing the history and understanding our value as a culture, right? And what we sell and what we represent. And then other funny things, you know, it's like right before COVID, we were, uh, we were asked by a Chinese group to put on a race in China. And so we were over there doing the groundwork. And I'm I'm in uh, Inner Mongolia, right in the middle of these dunes, and these guys ride up on these hand hand built cars, right? And it's like fence piping and you know what whatever they had, but they were mimicking our cars, right? You know, and they're like, well, we have a Toyota engine, so that's what we used, and you know, and I'm like, right. this is cool, man. Oh yeah, you know. So oh, if yeah. you think about that concept of like in a country that's like the exact opposite, you know, when you drill a hole through the globe. And technically, they're not supposed to have access to internet, right? right. And in our imagery, somehow they saw a photo and they were like, okay, yeah, let's really make it. This right. is really cool, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, so yeah. when you think about the impact of our culture globally, it's big. And I just don't think right. anybody's ever stood up, you know, in a boardroom or wherever and said, hey, we're taking credit for this. And we're here to do that now, you right. know, and, and I, I, can't thank you guys enough for laying the foundation for that because you know we have a better opportunity now than we've ever had so i, I have oh. high hopes for it oh, that's awesome and, and you and you and your group you guys do think outside the box and that's and, and what i mean by that is like a lot of people that they've seen the mickey thompson uh stadium racing you know and there again another really rough course but the funny thing about mickey thompson he had to figure out how to make it. The, the insurance policies on those stadiums, Yeah, you could only go 50 miles an hour. Yeah. And so he had to make it look like those things are going faster. Yep. That's why when you watch any of those tapes, you have the red and white barriers. Yep. Because when a camera pans by the red and white barriers, it causes a speed effect, and Mickey figured that out. Yeah. And so little things like that, just it, it's, it's amazing thinking of the history. And, well, how did he... You know, how did he make 50 miles an hour look exciting? Oh, yeah. well, it was super exciting. <laughs> and, um, uh, and, and that's that you have to be creative, and it's going to take guys like yourself creative to, to keep this in. And, and, and facilities like Cranon here that have, that have got history, it's been unbelievable. And yeah. the Flannery family is just, uh, and the board, uh, that used to own it and everything, just, I mean, they put their heart and soul into this. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, when it's, and what it's grown from when I was here, you know, uh, to to now is crazy. And one thing that was amazing when I first came here back to '94, uh, when I first came here with Herzogs, uh, I I remember taking and and uh, uh, I think I got a second. And we go to the drivers' meeting on Saturday, and I go to the drivers' meeting on Sunday, and uh, and Jake and Clifford were up there talking and. And they said, hey, we had a record year, or we had a record crowd. It was unbelievable the amount of crowd we had and this and that. And So what we're going to do, now this is in the 80s. This right. is 84. We're going to put we're gonna put an extra $10,000 into the Class 8 program in a purse. We're going to, and I'm like, are you kidding me? Who does this? Yeah. You know, they already have us there. Yeah. But they just did it. That was their passion. And, and I remember 
that made such an impact on me when I left Crandon. I told I've told that story hundreds of times, yep. and just uh, and the buggy, you know, they just they just threw they just gave didn't throw away gave away fifty thousand dollars of their income in that drivers meeting, breaking it down into the different classes, and yeah. and everybody was walking away with some sort of check and everything, and. And then it topped off. I think I won the race. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> worked too. You know, well, but, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that worked. But anyway, uh, uh, just. But it takes, like you said, this our sport. Our sport has such a passion, and it starts with the roots. I think people don't realize that the roots of of camping, and like you were saying, and 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 off roading in general. You don't have to be racing. You might be out there riding your quad or riding your side by side or jeeping. Yeah. And you, you those kind of people all. There's all kinds of things in their lifestyle that they buy, and and they they end up those people want to come see our races, yeah. And uh, when they find out about it, they're hooked every time, you know. Yeah. I still go out to the desert. I've been going out to the desert all my life, you know, with a play car and all this stuff, and still love doing it. Yeah. And it's amazing just to see uh, how many people enjoy our desert and, and how lucky we are. Yeah. Uh, to to have that opportunity and what it does for the family and the family unit and how it keeps everybody bound together and a kid that grows up in the desert, I think has three times the chance of of succeeding uh, than a kid that doesn't. You know, I remember when I was young, I I mean I get I got to the point where there was where there was you know uh, parties or people's houses or whatever. Hey, we're gonna have this party. We're gonna have that party as in junior high or something like that and and we were going to go jeeping and no i'm not going to no part i'm going jeeping with my parents you're going to go with parents yeah heck yeah Yeah. man so um anyway cool very true yeah yeah well i know you got a couple things to do here i really appreciate you You taking the time thank you for doing this yeah i appreciate it it was fun yeah anytime all right